Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem and today we will have a look at Benedetto Marcello's satirical text on how not to produce an opera in 1720s Venice. Very often, sources that discuss performance practice warn us against bad practices, against things that we must avoid. In many cases, though, these instructions reflect a reality where those bad practices, to the resentment of the writer, were in fact common practice. This is taken to the extreme in Benedetto Marcello's satirical text from 1720, Il Teatro alla Moda where he offers ironic instructions to the various people involved in the production of a modern opera. It gets clear quite quickly that in Marcello's opinion, the modern opera practices of his time are a disgrace. In this episode, we will present highlights from this unique source and see how much we can also sympathize with his complaints. Let's start. In our days, in most cases, the most important and influential figure in an opera production is the stage director, followed by the musical director. In early 18th century Venice, however, things were very different. To start off, there was no stage director. A producer, called the impresario in Italian, hired a poet to write a libretto, and a composer to set it to music. The composer, in most cases, was also the musical director. But the power of these seemingly central figures over the production was not so great. Those with the most power were the star singers, referred to as the virtuosi, or prima donna and primo uomo. Their requests and demands were to be fulfilled immediately, regardless of the artistic compromises they might entail. This might have included replacing complete arias, cutting and chopping the texts, changing notes, costumes, and anything else that might have disturbed them. After all, if they didn't perform their parts well, the extremely harsh Venetian audience would have scorned the production and brought a financial crisis upon the institution. Also, due to the high demand of productions, an impresario would often ask for new operas on very short notice, leading to poor workmanship in all aspects of the work from the writing to the performance. Interestingly, however, the decline in the quality of the early 18th century Venetian operas did not lead to a decline in their popularity. This might be the reason that brought Benedetto Marcello, a Venetian nobleman, composer, lawyer, and member of the Venetian government, to publish Il Teatro alla Moda, which encapsulates his frustration with the genre. His 1720 publication, that at first was published anonymously, is entitled The Fashionable Theatre, or A Sure and Easy Method to Compose Well and to Produce Italian Operas in the Modern Fashion. Below the enigmatic engraving of a bear with a wig waving a flag, in what seems like standard credits, appear names and anagrams of famous contemporary opera-related personalities, such as composers, producers, and opera stars, most famous of whom, at least nowadays, is the composer Antonio Vivaldi. Having this as a background, we can now read the instructions Marcello gives to the creators of the opera, namely the impresario, the producer, the librettist, and the composer. By the way, the caricatures used in the animations were made by Antonio Maria Zanetti, who depicted real opera stars in Venice at the very period of Marcello's writing. Disclaimer, the quotes presented in this episode were sometimes shortened and rephrased. Like always, viewers are encouraged to read the original text for themselves. The modern impresario must not know anything at all about the theater, music, poetry, or painting. He may hire some stage hands conductors, dancers, tailors, and extras, but in this he should use the utmost economy, so that he can spend more on singers, especially prima donnas, as well as on the bear, a tiger, flashes of lightning, thunderbolts, and earthquakes. 
he should urge the librettist to write truly stunning scenes, to be sure to employ the bear at the end of each act, and to close the opera with the usual wedding scene. On the fourth day of the month, he should give the libretto to the composer, advising him that the first performance will take place on the twelfth and not a day later, and that in order to speed up the composing, he should not bother about any impossible sounding passages, parallel fifths, octaves or unisons. He should hire the cheapest available singers, young girls who have never been on the stage before. He should consider the beauty of their bodies more important than that of their voices. If any of the singers ask him for a guarantee of their salary, he can answer them that he has no guarantee that they will please the public. In the case of an argument put up by some of the virtuosi about their pay, the impresario will demand that they reimburse him for any sour notes, bad acting, and for any cold they might have had. A writer of operatic librettos, if he wants to be modern, must never have read the Greek and Latin classic authors, nor should he do so in the future. After all, the old Greeks and Romans never read the modern writers. He should write the whole opera without any preconceived plan, but rather proceed verse by verse. For if the audience never understands the plot, their attentiveness to the very end of the opera will be ensured. The text of the aria must in no way be related to the preceding recitative, but it should be full of such things as sweet little butterflies, bouquets, nightingales, quails, little boats, little huts, jasmine, violets, tigers, lions, whales, crabs, turkeys, etc. Thus the poet will demonstrate to the world his proficiency as a natural scientist, who, by his well-chosen similes, shows off his knowledge of animals, plants, flowers, etc. During the rehearsals, he must not reveal any of his dramatic intentions to the actors, since he rightly assumes that they will do as they please anyway. If some of the actors should ask him from where they are to go on the stage and in which direction they should make their exit, or if they have a question about acting or costumes, he will tell them to do all of these things however they like. Hashtag no stage director. The modern composer should not know any rules about composition, except some vague generalities. He need not understand the numerical proportions in their relation to music, the advantages of contrary motion or the disadvantages of tritones. He need not know how many modes there are or how to distinguish them or how they are divided, or what their characteristics are. Instead, he might declare on this subject that there are only two modes, namely major and minor. He will employ accidentals completely arbitrarily. To ensure his arriving and staying at such a state of ignorance, he should not be able to read fluently, or to write a single sentence. Needless to say, he should not know any Latin at all, though he will compose pieces for the church. He should have no understanding of poetry or diction, long and short syllables, or of the general possibilities of the stage. He must not allow himself to read the entire libretto, as that might confuse him. Rather, he should compose it verse by verse, and insist immediately that all arias be rewritten by the librettist. This is the only way in which he will be able to employ all the melodies that had come into his head during the summer. But if the words to these arias should again fail to fit the notes properly, and that happens most commonly, he will continue to harass the librettist until the letter satisfies him completely. All arias should have an instrumental accompaniment, and care should be taken to have every part move in exactly the same note values. Noise is what counts in modern music not harmonious sound, which would consist of diverse note values, or the interchanging of tied and accented notes. He must not forget that happy and sad arias should alternate throughout the opera, from beginning to end, regardless of any meaning of text, music, or stage action. If nouns such as father, empire, love, arena, kingdom, beauty, courage, heart, should appear in the aria, the modern composer should write long coloraturas over them. This applies to no, without, and already, 
and other adverbs. It will serve to bring about a little change from the old custom of using coloratura passages only over words expressing an emotion. Every modern composer should drop an occasional remark that he writes in a rather popular style and violates the rules frequently only in order to satisfy his audience. He will thus blame the taste of the listeners who, it is true, sometimes like bad music, because that is what is performed, and because they are not given a taste of better compositions. He should speed up or slow down the tempo of the arias according to every whim of the singers and he should swallow all their impertinences, remembering that his own honor, esteem and future are at their mercy. For that reason, he will change, if desired, their arias, recitatives, sharps, flats, naturals, etc. The modern composer should show himself extremely attentive towards all female opera stars. He should give them presents and assure every one of them that she was the one with whom the opera would stand or fail. This he should also say to all the other singers, to everyone in the orchestra, to the extras, the bear, and to the earthquake. And now, let's see what Marcello has to say to the performers of the operas, the singers and players. The modern virtuoso should never have practiced solfeggio during his student days or later on in his career. There would be too much danger that he might finish his notes properly, or that he might sing in tune and in time, and this would be entirely out of keeping with modern practice. To become a virtuoso, a singer does not need to be able to read or write, or to pronounce vowels and diphthongs correctly, nor does he have to understand the text. He must be an expert, however, at disregarding sense and at mixing up letters and syllables in order to show off flashy passages, trills, appoggiaturas, and endless cadenzas. In this caricature, we see a representation of the long cadenzas of the star castrato Antonio Bernacchi. They are very long, go higher than San Marco's campanile, and of course, end with a trillo. If the singer can acquire the habit of complaining that he is in bad voice, that he hasn't sung a note in ages, that he is half dead with a terrible cold, headache, toothache and stomach ache, he will have proved that he is a real modern virtuoso. He should always find fault with his part. Its character does not fit his personality at all, and the arias present no challenge to his ability. In such a case, he will simply substitute some little piece by a piece by another composer, assuring everyone that it is a terrific hit. At the performance, he should sing with his mouth half closed, and with his teeth firmly pressed together. In short, he should do everything to prevent the understanding of a single word. He may be as capricious as he wants to in his acting. For the modern virtuoso must not understand the meaning of the words he is singing. Thus, it is not necessary for him to plan any of his gestures or steps. Hashtag no stage director. The virtuosa must demand that her part be sent to her as soon as possible. Under no circumstance must she try to understand the meaning of any of the words, not by herself nor with the help of someone else. She must ask her teacher to teach her the part and to write for her all the embellishments in a book especially provided for that purpose. The teacher will write the embellishments underneath the voice part, where the accompaniment should have been copied. Any embellishments he happens to think of at the moment, the more the merrier. Though he does not have the faintest idea about the composer's intentions regarding the tempo of the arias or the accompaniment. In the middle of the aria, the virtuosa might suffer a coughing spell, and Her Excellency, the mother, will intervene. To tell the truth, this piece didn't arrive until practically yesterday, and she is actually sight-reading it now. She should also follow the example of the virtuoso mentioned above and suffer from perpetual coughs, head colds, influenza, headaches, throat aches, and aches, and lament Heavens, what kind of town is this anyway? My head is heavy as a brick from the terrible air, 
and the local bread and wine makes me so sick that I am half dead. The modern virtuosa should sing cadenzas that last for an hour each, and stop frequently to take a breath. She should always sing the highest notes, which are beyond her range, and during every trill she must turn and twist her neck. Asked about her range by the conductor, she will invariably claim that it is two or three more notes in either direction than is actually the case. The violin player should never pay attention to the conductor or concertmaster. He should only use the upper half of the bow and always play forte. He should embellish his part as he sees fit. The concertmaster, when he has an obbligato accompaniment to an aria, should always push the tempo and never play in time with the singer. At the end of the aria, he should display a never-ending cadenza, seemingly improvised, but in reality carefully worked out at home, with arpeggios and passages in double stops. Though all violins should be in tune with each other, they should never get the pitch from the harpsichords or basses. Oboes, flutes, trumpets, bassoons, and other wind instruments should always play out of tune and produce a perpetual crescendo. Marcello continues this farce by offering instructions also to the theatrical engineers, painters, actors of the comic parts, tailors, pages, extras, prompters, copyists, and patrons. Special and lengthy comical instructions are also given to the mothers of the female singers. As always, I encourage you to read it for yourselves. This source is extremely interesting, not only because it reveals the problematic aspects of 18th century opera productions, but also because it touches on human vices in general, which have remained exactly the same over the centuries. Perhaps thanks to this, Marcello's publication was a great success and was reprinted over a period of 200 years. This was it for now. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you like early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.